Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Even though King David was not a perfect man, he was serious about serving God, serious about worshiping God, wanting to be an individual that God was well pleased with. So that leads me to this question, what about you? Are you an individual that wants truly to serve God, that God would be pleased with you and your utmost desire? is to worship Him properly. When you have that desire, it will serve as an invitation for God to move in your life. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Psalms and Psalm 26. Now, this is a great psalm for maturity. Saying the things, doing the things, understanding the things that bring about a change in our life where we become more and more like God. We will think more like God. We will do the things that God would have us to do. And we will transform. And the evidence of that will be a God-pleasing testimony. This is what the spiritual life is all about. Being like Him. And we're going to learn from David in this psalm some of the principles, some of the things that we need to learn and do, that is, implement into our life in order that we do, in fact, have that testimony that is pleasing to God, that reflects his standards of righteousness, his perspective on morality and justice, and those things that accomplish his purpose. So let's begin verse 1, Psalm 26 and verse 1. The first thing that is recorded in the biblical text is this phrase, Le David, which means of David. It tells us that this psalm was authored by him. And then we begin where it says, Judge me, O Lord. Now, that word, judge me, obviously, he's not calling God to place wrath upon him. When he says, judge me, remember what we've learned in other studies, that judgment, we can think of it as a coin with two different sides. One is that punishment, that that condemnation, or that discipline, but the other is a vindication. It is like the judge proclaiming a verdict saying that you are the one that is right, that he makes a decision in your favor. And that's what David is pleading for. This is what David's objective is, to live a life where God says you are right. Why? because we've agreed with God. In the same way that when you go before a judge, a proper judge, he's going to find in your favor if you have done what is expected, that you have followed the law, that you have kept the framework that society demands. Well, in the kingdom of God, there's that same type of of paradigm. We are supposed to keep the things that the kingdom of God demands, that is, justice and righteousness, that which manifests the glory of God. So David says, judge me, but we could understand it. Vindicate me, O Lord. Now, he's not asking for that because God has sovereignly chosen him, and that choice makes him one who will be vindicated. That's not what David says here. 
What he says here, he gives a reason. He says, vindicate me, O Lord, because I in, and this word is a word of integrity. It can also be understood as a word of dependence or reliance upon. Some have translated with the word innocent, but it's innocent because one has trusted, one has relied, one has depended. One realizes that his own inadequacies and therefore they have trusted in God. So David is saying, vindicate me, O Lord, because in dependence, in innocence, I have walked. And when he says innocence, if we translate it in this way, it means that he, because of God's activity in his life, he has fulfilled the objectives of God. And isn't that what you want to be able to testify before God? That you have been faithful, that you have fulfilled the expectations that the Lord has for your life. This is what success and prosperity is all about, that you have properly acted in light of God's truth, God's will, God's revelation. And David is saying that when we do that, we can expect God to move to vindicate his people. He also says, and this supports this, this way of understanding the word here to me, for integrity, my integrity, my innocence, my dependence. He says, and in the Lord, I have trusted. And that means that he has exercised faith, that he's heard what God said, God's provision, God, how he moves in a person's life in order to bring about forgiveness, to bring about atonement, to bring about redemption, to bring about a change whereby we become a new creation. Now, in David's time, these things were so solely foreshadowed. They were only known by revelation, and the fulfillment of them, obviously, was, was not yet at hand because Messiah had not done his work. But we see here the principles of faith and trust. And so David says, in the Lord I have trusted. And he says, I will not stumble. I have not fallen. And what he says here in the message is this. Trust leads to stability. When we put our faith in God, we're going to find a strength to be able to stand. In other words, we will not be moved. And that's what the enemy over and over wants to do. Move us away from where God would have us. But when we trust, depend, rely, demonstrate faith, it is going to be an anchor for life that also not only holds us in the right location, but it's also going to be a force that stands us upright so that we can once more bear witness, give a testimony that we are not going to be moved and brought down by the enemy. Verse 2. Here he says, Bechaneni. And this is a word for, for testing. So he says to God, test me. And this is for the purpose of knowing his spiritual condition. See, you cannot grow. You will not mature. You will not see spiritual change in your life until God tests you. And this testing is not for the Lord's purposes, meaning this. He doesn't need to test you to know where you are spiritually. God knows it. He knows everything. He understands every aspect about you physically and spiritually. So when David says, test me, David wants the results. He wants to see where he is from God's perspective, how God sees his life. So he says, test me, O Lord, 
and try me. And this implies, this trying me may imply, it's the same word, for putting someone in a, a testing situation that is in a, an experience. And oftentimes this experience is a difficult one. So David realizes to be tested and tried means that he's going to be to be tested in this world in being placed in some difficult circumstances. This will give him the opportunity to demonstrate biblical truth, those principles that the Word of God reveals. So if you want to grow, you want to mature, you want to become more like Messiah, you want to be pleasing to God, then expect to be tested, to be put in circumstances where in order to come through them, you're going to have to utilize biblical truth, the principles of Scripture, these precepts that the Word of God reveals so that you will have success. What's success? Accomplishing God's will at a given moment, being faithful to His his desires, what he wants you to do. So David says, trust me, O Lord, try me. And then he speaks about a word of refinement. This testing and trying produces refinement. Where? Notice there's two words. The words for my kidneys and my heart. Now, we think of kidneys in an entirely different way than the Bible does. This word speaks along with heart for, for the thought process, for the conscience. So what it's saying is this, when I go through testing and trying those difficult times in my life, they are going to be used by God and benefit me in order to purify, refine my conscience, that is how I see things, what the inner man realizes, how he speaks to me, and also how the Holy Spirit, how he communicates with me. In actuality, it helps me, these refinement helps me to discern the Holy Spirit, helps me to understand his, his words of instruction, his guidance and leadership. So if we want to grow, we want to mature, expect those trying and testing circumstances. They will have a spiritual refinement in your life. They will give you a new way of, of perceiving things. And that new way is going to be closer and closer and closer to how God sees things. Verse, verse 3. Now, we don't go very far in our study of, of the book of Psalms until we encounter this word chesed or grace. And we see that God's grace, it was foreshadowed in the old covenant. It was, was bestowed upon people, but not to the degree that, that the work of Messiah can bring it about in our life. In the same way, the Holy Spirit he, of course, is eternal, the third member of the Trinity. He was at work previously. He is now, and he will be. He is eternal. He is omnipresent. He is God. But we see that there are differences in how the Holy Spirit worked in, in the Tanakh in the Hebrew Bible during the time of the Old Testament and how now he works in a, a specific manner in the life of the believer, the follower of Messiah. But look at verse 3. For your grace is before my eyes. What this tells us is that God's grace, we know that grace saves us. But God's grace also is a lens that we look through. When we receive the grace of God, it will have an impact on how we see things, the decisions, the discernment that we have. So you'll never have spiritual discernment 
until you first receive the grace of God. And notice this perception that God gives us, this new new way of seeing things. It impacts how we live because he says, and I have walked, or literally I will walk in your truth. So we see here that grace has many purposes in this context. This verse says grace is a lens that helps me perceive things properly. Grace enables me to walk. And it's interesting because if you're just looking at this at an English Bible, you're going to miss out something or in any other language because this is not the word halakti. This is what we would expect. But there's a unique construction for this verb because this is the word hit halakti. What's the difference? Well, it's in the verbal construction known as the hit pa'el. This is the reflexive going back and forth. And what it shows is a consistency in this, this construction. David says, I have received your grace. It is before my eyes all the time. And as an outcome of that, I will walk consistently. Doesn't matter where I am. There will be that that walk, that behavior, that lifestyle that is impacted by God's grace. And that grace will cause me to walk consistently wherever I am. How? Notice what it says. In your truth. And God's truth is the only truth. And that truth is the same for you and me and everyone else. It does not vary by by time period. It does not change in different culture. God's truth is absolute. And unfortunately, that that principle is under attack today. Verse 4. I will not set with men of vanity. Now, the word here for men or people vanity speaks about a, an individual that really does not reflect the things of life. When we embrace that which from God's perspective is vanity, futility, has no kingdom connection, has no eternal influence. When we do that, we are making decisions like a dead person would make. They have no lasting purpose. They serve nothing in regard to life, the life that God wants us to live. And he says, with, and it's speaking about other individuals. Now, what What one translation says in using this verb, and the word here speaks about those individuals that uh, disappear. And we see a correlation between that which is vain and that which is no more. It it disappears. It doesn't have any eternal uh, implication to it. What's interesting is that the rabbinical commentators, they translate this word, or at least they they tell us the meaning as it's individuals that, that do sins in secret place. Because the word ne'ilam means that which disappears, that which is invisible, that which cannot be seen. So those who practice that which is vain, futile, they, they do those behaviors in secret. It's a way of saying that they know their behaviors are not good. They don't want to be public about it. As we approach the end times, people will be more bold, more, more visible in regard to their sinfulness. But really what this word is, is simply the word for disappearing. It says, with those who are disappearing, those who are going to be no more. Those who the judgment of God is going to cast out into other darkness, he says, with those, I do not 
go. He does not walk with them. He does not associate with them. These are not his friends. These are not his associates. So David is using discernment to see who has a kingdom connection, who is living with the understanding that it's not tomorrow we die, so let's eat, drink, and be happy today. But rather, David is looking for those that understand with God, his covenant, his work in our life of redemption, there is an eternality to man. And those who reject the eternity of, of human existence, they're going to be very surprised because they're going to experience eternal condemnation. Their, their death is not going to bring about a conclusion, but it's simply going to be a different reality that will continue without end of God's punishment. Verse, verse 5, David says, I hate the congregation of evildoers. Now, there are some things that we should hate. It's because I love righteousness that I should hate unrighteousness. Because I love mercy, I should hate those that, that do, never, do not ever extend mercy. So love, because we love certain things, we're going to have a disdain for others. And David says here, I hate the congregation of evil doers. And with the wicked ones, I will not sit. And some have pointed out that this word for sitting has to do with, with fellowship. So it's another way of saying I don't associate with these individuals. I am not going to be in their presence because they will have a negative influence on me. Now, it is true, and we're going to go off on a brief tangent, for the purpose of serving God, we can associate with them for revealing truth, telling them the revelation of God, sharing with them conviction, where their wickedness, their evil deeds, where that's going to take them, sharing with them God's righteous standards, his expectations, his mercy, his grace, how they can experience forgiveness, how they can have new life. Obviously, we can associate with people, evildoers, for that purpose, but we're not going to have fellowship with them. As Paul says, what what fellowship does good and evil, light and darkness, what, what fellowship can they have with one another? So it's only for the purpose of, of ministry. Verse, verse 6. I wash in, and this is word nikayon. Now I say that because it's important be, for us to, to know that word. It's a word for that which is clean that which has been cleansed. So David says, I wash in that which is clean. The point is this, something that's dirty is not going to get you clean. You don't take something that is dirty and something else that's dirty, putting them together and believe that one of those things is going to come out clean. So David is simply telling something that's very simple to understand. I wash in that which is clean my hands. And notice what he's speaking about here, because what is he referring to when he says, I wash in that which is clean? Notice he says, and I go around your altar, O Lord. So that which is clean in this context Based upon the laws of Hebrew poetry, we see that it's referring to that which brings cleansiness. And what brings that which is clean? It's the altar. We see God's, God's methodology that sacrifice, that an offering offered up to God can bring about purity in our life. So David is saying, 
It's in that one which is pure. Remember a sacrifice cannot have any blemishes, any flaws. And that's why Messiah was without sin. So in that one which is impure, that one which is pure, that one which is clean, clean, this is where we're going to find, find the ability to change us, to make ourselves clean, to wash it with him. Verse 7, to hear, and notice, it's having been cleansed that we can hear from God. He says to hear the voice, or literally, to make heard. It's in the hifil. Very important that we pay attention to this grammatical nuances of the text. So it's to make heard the voice of thanksgiving. There is a correlation between finding God as our cleaner, God who purifies us. And of course, this involves the forgiveness of sins, but also the redemptiveness of God, him redeeming us from our sins. And with that, he says, to make heard the voice of thanksgiving and to tell all your wonders. Now, I made a notation next to this word, les saper. Les saper means to tell. And it, in a noun form, it's the word sefer, which is book. So you write things down. But again, as I was preparing and looking at others, we see, for example, in, in some of the most predominantly accepted commentators from Judaism, and I turned there because of their understanding of the Hebrew. And here they use a different word to help us understand. Les Sapers to tell, but they give an alternative meaning, not the simple meaning but one that I believe is highly appropriate. And that's the word lefaret, which is to detail, to, to make specific. And the nuance for us, the takeaway, is that yes, we are supposed to make others hear the voice of our thanksgiving. And we should tell of God's wonders in a very specific manner. And this all relates to the power of, of testifying of how God has worked in a person's life. Verse 8. O oh Lord, I, I love, and this is actually I have love, and it doesn't mean he stopped loving, but it speaks about David's complete love, his, his eternal love that he has for the the dwelling place of God's house. Now, it uses two words, that which speaks of a dwelling place, a residence, and then your house. Now, some will say your holy residence, your holy house, but, but literally, two words are used to speak about the fact that God has a dwelling place and it's called his house. And the message here is very simple. David loves being part of, of God's family. That when we enter into a covenant with him, we enter into a family relationship. And that's why God's residence is truly a home, a place of, of dwelling. And then it has the word, your glory, a place where your glory dwells a tabernacle of your glory, in other words. And this speaks about a very important biblical truth, and it is this. When we are, are with God, experiencing intimacy with him, we are going to know the glory of God. Drawing close to God, it is related to the manifestation of God's glory. So David is saying here, I want to be close to you. I want to dwell with you and I want to experience your glory. He wants to manifest the glory of God. Verse nine. And do not allow me is the implication to be gathered. Do not allow me to be gathered with 
the sinners. Now, when he says, do not allow me, the me is really at the end of this first half of the verse where we find the word nafshi, which is soul. So David says, do not allow my soul to be gathered with sinners and with men of bloodshed my life. David wants to have a different existence, a different experience. He does not want to be to be consumed, taken away by those that shed blood and those that practice sin. And notice the correlation between uh, the first and second half of this verse, where he says, do not allow my soul to be gathered with sinners. Now, whenever we have that word chet, it's in the plural, chataim. What he says here is, is basically, basically he's, he's revealing the outcome of sin because he then speaks about bloodshed. When you are, are practicing sin, you are ministering death. You are a vehicle, an instrument of death. And David doesn't want to be associated with that. Verse 11. Which in their hands is a scheme, a plot, a plot of evil. And in their right hand, their right hand is full of a bribe. Now, what we see is that in order to accomplish their evil schemes, they're willing to pay a bribe. And that's why the love of money is the root of all evils. If you love money, you can be bribed. There is a price that can get you to do all types of evil. That's why we cannot be mastered by money. That's why Messiah says you can't serve two masters, and he's speaking about God and money. Because when you are committed to money, you're going to hate God. But when you are committed to God, you will utilize wealth and resources properly. So this scripture, very informative for us. He says, do not gather my soul with sinners and with men of bloodshed my life. Because in their hands is an evil scheme, and in their right hand, it's full of a bribe. Verse 11. He says this same word again, this word that speaks about innocence, integrity, reliance, dependence upon God. He says in verse 11, and I in my dependence, my Reliance, reliance upon God. And this speaks about his innocence because when we rely upon God, we're not going to be moved into sin. So he says, and I in my integrity, I will walk. And then he says, redeem me and be gracious unto me. Now we see a correlation between the concept of redemption and grace. And David is saying, I am going to walk in, and if we really translate it properly, I am going to walk in dependence upon God. I'm going to rely upon him. I'm going to trust him. And therefore, David expects God, because God's promised this, that God will move in order to bring redemption. Now, we need to understand this in a couple different ways. First of all, there's, of course, the concept of redemption when we have our sins totally forgiven. We're granted eternal life, and that is speaking about eternal redemption. But another part of redemption manifests that we are God's purchased possessions. And there is a degree of obligation that God takes upon himself. Now, this obligation, he placed in the new covenant. 
He has obligated himself because he knew the weakness and the frailty of, of human beings. So here, David says, and in my reliance, my trust, my dependence, I will walk. He's trusting God. And he believes God will move in order to demonstrate and do the things because David belongs to God. He is God's purchased possession. And therefore, he can expect God's favor. Now, this is the word Chen, it's in the verbal condition, but it's related to the word chesed, which is grace, but this has a nuance of favor. David is saying, I, I trust in you, God, that when's necessary, you are going to acknowledge me as your purchased possession, and therefore you are going to act in favor for me. You are going to show a preference. Why? Because David is better, nicer, smarter, more spiritual? No. Because he has entered into a covenant. It's that covenant that makes all the difference. Verse 12, and we'll conclude. My feet stood in, the word is uprightness. Now, as I studied this word, mishor, it speaks about a plane, that which is flat, that which brings stability. But as I studied, we see that that concept of stability is very important. What David is saying is, I have, have placed my feet, I've stood them in the place of stability. And where is that? Now, oftentimes, when I ask a question like that in a group, so where do you find spiritual stability? And people will begin to just answer, and they'll answer based upon whatever comes into their mind or maybe some other thing that they've learned. Here's the problem. Answer based upon the text we're studying. Almost without exception, when I ask a question, saying, tell me the answer to something, it's always in this passage. And this is a case as well. Notice how the, the verse begins. My feet stood in stability. Why well, want stability? Where do I put my feet? Notice what he says. Be mat helim avarech Hashem. And in your assemblies, in your congregations, he says, I will bless the Lord. Now, blessing the Lord, that term has to do with worship. Congregation, a place, an assembly where men and women of faith come together. And this brings stability to our life where we can worship God properly. And it's through worship that change comes into our life. Now, I normally do not like to make these teachings time sensitive by, by speaking about current events, but I'm going to make an exception as we, we conclude. And that is, this is being shared during the time of the coronavirus. I currently sitting here in Israel, and what I would share with you is that we are in our third major lockdown. We had one in the spring, then we had one in the summer, and now we have one in the winter. And what we see is that it really began in September. Those restrictions were never fully removed. And one of the things we're seeing all throughout the world because of this coronavirus is that it's okay to go to a casino. It's okay to do all sorts of stuff. But go to the congregation of the Lord to worship Him? This is not acceptable. This is 
too dangerous. This isn't essential. All of that is a lie from the enemy. The safest place that you can be is congregating together with fellow believers. Now, does that mean that that never in the congregation will anyone get sick? Didn't say that. But people get that disease through a variety of different means, different type of contacts, different ways. Don't be fearful. Give God priority. Do not forsake the assembly together. Now, it's fine to to use different other means of technology to strengthen one another, but you should be you should be assembling. Now, that doesn't mean in in great numbers where two or three are gathered, where there's a minion of 10 Find a place where you can meet and don't be fearful of the disease. Give God respect. Have a proper heavenly fear because that type of fear is the beginning of wisdom. Don't ignore what he says. He speaks about placing his feet in a place of stability. And that place of stability, what gives him spiritual stability and stability in every other type of of stability is when we assemble, when we stand in the congregation to bless the Lord, to worship the Lord. This is truly essential. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.